Jeff, hey. you've got four eyes. Did you want those sunglasses in this, by the way? Uh, it's it's used. It's up to you. When there's an emphatic moment, I'm going to nod my head, and they're going to and they're going to come down. They're going to come this down. This is the and kind really make of the point. Uh, yeah. This is the kind of podcast we're going to have today. I can tell. You think? Yeah. He shows up. This is Jeff Bursey, by the way, and he says, "Don't use my real name." <laughs> So I'll use a different name, cool. Jeff Boresi. There you go. Very nice person. So I have Jeff Boresi today on the Art Dealer Diaries. Now, Jeff is an interesting cat. We're going to have some fun here today. I've known Jeff for 20 years. I'd say so. Oh, yeah, at least 20 years. And you're one of the few people I think, when you come in, I usually just try to sit down and we chat just because I like to talk with you. Cool. So this is like even more chatting and maybe I get to get a little more granular and find out who Jeff Boresi is. So... Who's Jeff Bursey? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. It's um, Good. it's that's a cool thing where you know you asked me to do it. I was like, wow, that sounds like fun. And I watched a bunch of them, yeah. and I really enjoyed the Robert Summers. Yeah, he's amazing, got, isn't he? Yeah, where yeah. you got um, about fifty minutes into it and really started to yeah, that's right. Talk about somebody the else. Work. Somebody else said that too. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they they saw it was. You know, sometimes it takes a little while to for people to open up because it's not comfortable to be, uh, even though we know each other and we've talked a lot, it's sometimes not comfortable to talk yeah, about know, those kind of inner, yeah, those <laughs> inner things, you know, that, you know, make a human who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think you're one of the more interesting people that I've, I've run across in my life, which says something, just because you've always been creative, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you, you're making a living to, just using your creativity. So where where'd you grow up, Jeff? I don't even know. Uh, upstate Vermont, way up oh, on the border right. with you Quebec. You did tell me that. I did know that, actually. Yeah. And so how long did you grow up in Vermont? Are you a I Vermonter? Was, you I know? would say so, yeah. You know, like wherever I think somebody went to high school is kind of where they grew up. Yeah, yeah. You know, those developmental years. And yeah. Where you really kind of forge your personality by skipping school and going to the libraries and things. Yeah, and how does Vermont set that tone? I mean, because it is a different kind of a state, right? I mean, it's independent thinkers isolation, um, outdoors. I mean, all those kind of things is what I think of Vermont. What about you? What, is, what right. does Vermont mean to you? Well, it's an interesting thing. I think when you're in the thick of something, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. Uh -huh. and, and the older I get, the more I, the description you just gave, mm -hmm. but it was just what I knew. You know? right. I didn't know that any, any other place was different. Did you so, have kid, brothers and sisters? I had a sister. She's uh -huh. awesome. She lives in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, this she is works the in the biz. Is she a cinematographer? What does she, she do? She works with cameras. Yeah. yeah. I think pretty much anything that, you know, you have to tackle with a camera. Now it's, you know, obviously all digital. Right. So and is she older way. or younger? Uh, four years younger. Yeah. So, so you were the older kid. Yeah. And, um, and what about your parents? What do they do? Uh, my parents are enjoying their lives. At uh -huh. this point, yeah. Did they enjoy their <laughs> lives when you were growing up? They did. You know, that's a whole story in its own. Um, and my father was, and is, you know, he's an amazing, uh, one of those A-list guys, I think, you know, where it's adrenaline and, mm -hmm. you know, fast and, you know, test pilot for Grumman Aerospace. That's and what navigator. he was? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So that's crazy. Flying things that conceivably shouldn't fly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. for, like, new planes and jets and things like that? Yeah, yeah, in the and 70s, 60s and 70s. Was he also in the military? Uh, no, I don't think he ever made it into that wow. aspect of the military. At that point, he wasn't. But then, you know, he's a National Guard. And, and so where would he do the those test things? Those are all in Nevada and California, right? No, he was based out of Long Island, which huh? is where I was actually born. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, the potato and cauliflower fields of Long Island out there. So, would he, so he would actually go and fly these experimental planes and make sure yeah yeah what was that like i mean that did you know how dangerous a job that was every once in a while you would get it yeah. and you know, I, they have stories and i remember this vaguely but uh, my father being picked up in a helicopter mm. to go to work mm. and i thought it was a giant bug that would consume and spit my father <laughs> out <laughs> twice a day how old were you 20 at that time yeah for my yeah. 30s yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just and, didn't understand and so work. when did he retire from that uh, well, or did he? I think it was it was one of those things where my mother is like, okay, you have two kids now. Yeah, it's time for something else. Yeah, and that's when so, we came back to Vermont. So this all makes sense. What's that? So because his job is risk taking, to, yeah. and I've seen that same trait run through you as well. And you can go really, and I'll say, yeah. Like, yeah. let's talk about how you want to film, which I think is a horrible idea, but you want to film a gully washer going 
at eye level in an arroyo. Oh, just a flash flood in, yeah, in flash a flood, specific yeah. place. Well, everywhere I go, there seems <laughs> to be a home away from home. Yeah. There's a place here in Tucson in the Tucson Mountains called Kings Canyon, which has become that that place for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny when I was, uh, how would I say it? Like when I was in my, you know, late teens, early 20s, mm-hmm. we lived in a uh, kind of a punk rock flop house. And that's really my aesthetic. Is, uh-huh. Yeah, I believe you know, that. And, uh, I would have never guessed by this dress. I dressed up today. Man. I know. It's a clean hat. Mark. It was a clean hat. He was going to put on a new <laughs> shirt. He goes, nah. It's here. I can prove it. And I can tell you, this is not like for today. This is Jeff. You're it's saying me, it yeah. is exactly. Yeah. But anyway, we digress. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so, so the canyon. The canyon, yeah. Um, so like, I worked at this place called Whiting Floors when I was in, you know, in my early 20s, uh-huh. late teens. And uh, we all kind of worked there. We would take shifts, make money, go to our uh, 29 cent menu mm-hmm. at Taco Bell, get all the vegetarian stuff we could get, have yeah. feasts. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember one of the guys that worked there, one of the higher ups, um, we would be locked in these buildings, these kind of nice, you know, stereo places or places kind of like Bed Bath and Beyond or something like that, but right. a little bit higher. We'd be locked in there overnight cleaning the floors, you know. I remember one of the guys described me as always wanting to be homeless. You know, with digs like this, who needs a who needs a place to live? You know, you right. clean the floors, you right. run with the machine, and you have the rest of the night to listen to loud music. Yeah. Um, but that's like that home away from home thing where you can you can uh, just be one with the rhythms of some place. Right. And for me, like nature, having grown up in Vermont, trees, and you know, it's really not that different being here than there. No, I can see that. You know, and New sure. Mexico is like kind of that smashed yeah. in between. Yeah, no, I can see that too, actually. Yeah. So and the the fl- flash flood idea. Yes, tell me about that. <laughs> was uh, I I record things in nature and manipulate them and use them. For yeah, you a, like sound, right? Yeah, I love yeah, sound. Sound is a, sound. A, sound and music is all part of your whole. Being, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. It keeps me from uh, running a tree and you know running a car into a pole or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, so I was out one day with equipment, and you know, I, you know how when you do things, you're obviously you're paying attention, you're making sure you're not tripping as you go right. through these beautiful places. And all of a sudden, I just looked up, and the sky was black right above me. I was like, hmm, "Are we allowed to swear on this thing?" And somewhat. No, <laughs> he's not saying yes or no. Yeah. Oh, you, on this, I don't give a shit what okay, you okay, Oops, good. there it goes. Because that would be. <laughs> be hard for me not to. <laughs> so I look up and I'm like, oh shit, you know, what am I going to do? You know, and I knew, I know the area very well. So I ended up get, making my way down to a safer place because the lightning's intense yeah. in the desert, you know, very intense, super intense when it's coming down on you. And then the, you know, the initial rain, which is very cold. And, and so I made it to this overhang where there's a lot of petroglyphs right. and set up my recording equipment and, you know, I had a camera right. and uh, unfortunately I couldn't get the camera going, but just at that moment, it's like it was a like then one of those moments where everything comes, everything comes to you, and you understand everything, and it's like almost like slow motion. Must be what you know the, the person who catches the winning thing in the yeah. state championships feels like. Yeah, or you have you're in the zone. Yeah, yeah. totally, completely immersed, yeah. and you're hearing everything. Everything makes sense, and uh, right at that moment, you could feel like the the warm uh, the warm rain coming through the earth because I'm underneath you know, rock. Yeah. It's just warm and the, the rain out there is cold and he's feeling all this and uh, a lightning struck, a lightning strike happened um, just above and beyond, behind me yeah. on the earth and I could feel it come up through the earth. And it was like, there's a moment in the was, recording where you hear me, it snaps and you hear me go, Ugh. And was, I so see you actually felt the electricity? Yeah. Yeah, because the water's there, you're wet. Yep. And the sound had to be intense because I've been close to those, and it's just deafening. It's and amazing, the, and the light is just blinding. Yep, the rip. It yeah. feels like it. It, yeah. it just rip of the earth. Like you're really hearing and participating yeah. in the rip. And you yeah. had that on sound. It's all yeah. It's all recorded, except for that blip moment where it, it hit. You know, right. um, but uh, it's only momentarily that that drops out like that. But then right at that, as that was happening. Um, the, the, you could hear it. You could the hear water. it. The water. It sounds like a train, right? Yep. It really and it's carrying boulders, you know, trees and And you're underneath a rock. Well, I'm underneath an overhang. Close to this wash. It's gonna go down right there. 
it's right where you're sitting right there. Yeah, but there's enough hiding. space and I could crawl up. You know, I knew the space, so I knew I was going to be safe. And uh, so as the, and I was like trying to get the camera going, I'm like, ah, you know, right. it just, and of course, at that moment, I'm like right. fumbling because yeah. I'm right. nervous. And, yeah, you know, of course. And I couldn't get it, but I got, you know, shots with my phone. But So you ran up into your little crevice where you could survive. Yep. I left all the equipment there and kind of the kept rain, going up. The big flash flood came through. Gully okay. washers, we call them where we're from. Okay. And then how long did that last? Uh, what do you mean? How long did the flood last? Oh, it, like, you know, for a long time. Yeah, like an hour and a half you kind know, of thing? Yeah, because I had to, uh, I was on the other side. My, my pickup truck was on the yeah, other side. Yeah, you have to wait until it plays out yeah well actually i was in the knucklehead and just got the biggest boulder i could carry and carried it and went across you know to just get out because it was gnarly yeah no I, scary. I, I, I actually do understand that but so you want to experience that same thing again well i want to get it to you know to use it and you want that you want it on film yeah but you want the same thing i want that yeah it's just it's so that's that adrenaline rush need. yeah but it's also an, an image rush yeah you know, yeah, you, and let's talk about that. You, so you visualize, you have synesthesia. You visualize things a little differently than other people, right? And mm -hmm. the way you see and hear things for color uh -huh. and music and things like that. I think everybody's got it to a degree. Mm -hmm. You know, that old thing of, uh, you know, smelling my, uh, apple pie and it's like your mother's apple pie. And right, you, back you visualize and, it and that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, um, I just, it just fires on all senses for me. And that's um, overwhelming at points, you know, just coming to a four-way stop. Is a trip. Yeah, tell what. Explain that. Uh, well, it's you got to approach it with. You know that this is going to happen. You have to depend on other people to. Yeah, it's just weird, but <laughs> no, I, I, I find it fascinating. You do? Okay. No, absolutely. Because yeah. I, I don't experience that. I just go, God damn it, go, go, go. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, with that situation, you somebody's obviously stopped before I am, and I'm tasting it, I'm hearing it, I'm like, fuck. Would you just, you know, I mean, that you know. Right. And it's funny, I have to stop and remember, okay, that, uh, just go. Dude, just go. Yeah. You know, it's no problem. Yeah. The, the amount of information coming in is the problem, where you have to kind of categorize it, organize it. And so I didn't learn about this until my, like, early 30s. Mm. I thought everybody was like Yeah, this. you were just, that's who you were. Yeah. So when you get lots of information coming to you, it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. And how do you stop that? Um, Does art or music or... Well, those places, you know. Yeah, all of that. Help. Uh, things where, you know, like, even just going to a thrift store where it's a complete disaster, mm -hmm. there's so much stuff, so many things, so much information coming in that it's negated. It's like um, it's like going to a bar to read. It's so noisy that mm -hmm. it's easy to come into a point. So you can go into a bar, take a book and read because there's yeah. so much going around you. It's somehow... It's a great place to read. You know, now that's funny because when I was in medical school, I would go not to bars to read, though mm -hmm. I probably should have at times. I would go to very busy areas where there was, it was semi-quiet, but there was action, people walking around doing things. Mm -hmm. And I found it easier to focus and yeah. I, on the stuff with action kind of around me. Yeah. And then every once in a while, I could just kind of stop, look, and enjoy the movement and sure. then go back. So I guess that's the same kind of Very similar. same thing. And I can write my murder mysteries in a Starbucks if I wanted. You're a synesthete. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so. As long as I have music going on, I have to have some kind of... No words, though, right? Uh, yeah. It, well, it can't be music I, I uh, really get no. into. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Jazz or blues are better because it's just kind of melodic and, you know, there's something about those that, you know... Yeah. But the Beatles would be a no, or the Eagles, I'd be like, you know, singing along with it, and I can't, sure. I can't concentrate. So you do have that same kind of sensibilities when you're in one of these modes, creating with music that it has to be something that's more musical than verbal. Well, it doesn't have to be musical at all. Um, just sound. Uh huh. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes music occurs. Do you have to have sound on? Most no, of the time? No. You don't mind quiet? I think I'm supposed to stay close to this thing. Yeah. Right? Speaking of sound. <laughs> Um, all sound, you know, it's, it comes down to all that, the Cajun stuff where, you know, was it 433 that, you know, David Tudor comes out, op flips open the, the piano and has right. a stopwatch. Uh, it's all, to me, it's all, uh, I wouldn't say entertainment, but it's always there. Mm -hmm. So there's no separation for, it's almost like, you know, if, if I hear Taylor Swift going by and some co-eds, 
you know, Prius or something real loud, it's the same as, you know, the, the beep, beep, beep as the, the, the stop sign, the stoplight, yeah, right. um, uh, which is all like a constant symphony. So I think that's why a lot of um, classical musical composers and people that are organizing different things. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine maybe a lot of physicist things like that, things like that, where there's a lot of um, intangible information, you know, that you can place together. Like, what does it sound like to put a, an oboe next to a violin? And what does it sound like? So all of that organization, yeah. I think something like this uh, really aids. Do you try to tap into that kind of all senses uh, awareness when you're creating? Because you make paintings and you make, you know, you do mounts and things like sure. that. Do you try to tap into that somehow? Oh, uh, I don't have to. It's, it's already, just it's there. there. Yeah. yeah, it just goes. It flows. It's a river and you can't turn it off. Can you sleep? Yeah, I sleep fairly well sometimes. Um, I went and got one of those little noise machines. Yes. You know, that work real great. Yeah. And uh, they do. I like them too. They do. Mm -hmm. They do because it just introduces that uh, that added um. yeah that added kind of thing to to um, deceive your focus I guess and, it would be kind of yeah and do you have vivid dreams uh, when I have them when I remember them yeah yeah you don't always, always remember dreaming. yeah yeah I always remember mine yeah which is weird yeah super re reoccurring ones too or recurring yeah. ones too um, that are you know very intense and ones that I've had since childhood yeah I've had those too yeah. We won't go into that today, <laughs> folks. <laughs> On another episode of the Art Dealer Diaries, I can go there. Um, so yeah, I want to digress. Doors. So and get back to when you left Vermont. Don't undress, Mark. I want to regress. Um, when you go, so you grow oh, up. By the way, dude, just just say I have to tell you this because yeah, this yeah, is a ahead. fascinating Tucson thing. Yeah, okay. On the way here, at that very four-way stop sign I was just talking that about. you're petrified in, yes. And I'm always petrified at. <laughs> I was coming, I was approaching it from the west, uh, heading east, and uh, and I looked to my left, because you know, the, the, the information coming in, and there was a guy with no pants on, and it looked like he went out, like literally no pants, his butt. Yeah. His butt. Yeah. And I didn't see the other part. Um, but it, it's like, that's that's like my Tucson. That's like, it's so funny. I just, well, he came out to like get his paper or something. It was awesome. <laughs> I was like looking around at other cars to see. Did you see that? Did anybody no else see on. it? I don't. He had I don't no know. clothes on at all, or he just had like no kind of a, yeah, top, like a, no like bottom, a white tank top that he probably slept in or something. Uh, that's why you're petrified of that four-way stop. It's got to be. That's it. It's exactly. really you've seen it before. You just now are recognizing it. It has it's nothing amazing. to do with anything else. It's like this is going to be a cool day. <laughs> it is. We're going to get deep, baby. So tell me, when you graduate from uh, Vermont from your high school in Vermont where you took off, right? You didn't hang out in Vermont. You did some cool stuff. Like you traveled the country and did some yeah, interesting things. We just, things. you know, went around, man. But you Came did something here. more than that. Didn't you go to meet some of these artists and writers? That, that was a little thought? bit later. Is it? Later. Okay. Yeah. So tell me what happens after you leave high school. Where did you go from there? It just came out here. You know, my to, dad came out for work, and I came out too, and then the rest of the family followed, and you know, everybody's still together. To, to so. Tucson or to Arizona? To Tucson. Oh, okay. So that's no, no. You, I'm sorry, not Tucson. Um, Mesa. So you Mesa, ended up Arizona. in Arizona because your family said, "Okay, we're coming here." Yeah, yeah. I and I also there was an added bonus because a lot of the music that I liked mm. was from that from the Phoenix area. Mm. So and what kind of, of music was of, that? You know, a lot of the punk and yeah. uh, a lot of the experimental things and. It was a super rich environment for art, and uh, despite what people may think, uh, the, the Tucson versus Phoenix situation. Right. Very odd. Um, so much going on, you know, and just very cool things, because it was so close to the West Coast, so there'd be things from San Francisco, things from Los Angeles, things from, you know, Vegas. And were you making and music, or you were just more so of much. an I mean, absorber? We were just always making stuff, but I was never in. I mean, we had one thing called Miss Teen USA, which was just a our whole our whole getup was it was just two of us, both named Jeff, and uh, we would go to parties and never bring instruments. But if there was a band, we would play during their breaks if they would <laughs> let us, and that was our band. Uh -huh. So essentially, what it the was two Jeffs. It was our concept. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it was essentially called Miss Teen USA. And uh, so it was very funny. <laughs> you got, what the, was that title? I got to ask her. Know, just, she just came. Oh, well, we were obsessed with a band called the Sun City Girls. So we had to be, you know, two guys uh, named. Okay. And they were all men. But um, so I, it was one of those things where, you know, we just start and it was just 
bass and drums and we were very funky and half the people would leave in rage and like yelling, think you guys don't know how to play. And the other half would dance wildly and have a blast. Yeah. So that was super fun. And at that point in time, because you're what, 20 maybe? Yeah. Did you go, this is my path in life. I need to be involved in music. I need to, no. no. Did you have a path? I still did don't you? have a path. No, that's true. I, I do know that this is, <laughs> this is a true statement. But did you have some yearning? You go, this is kind of what I want to do. Or you were you in just searching for you know, who you are, what you were, or did you know who you were, what you were? I don't know. No, it's just being, I think, um, yeah. you know, uh, reading certain things that I read, you know, the, the Zen hermits and the things that I'm recently getting back into. Um, you just read, uh, I don't know, like the people that I would eventually yearn to visit and do so in a lot of cases. I think one of the turning points was seeing G. Gordon Liddy and uh, Timothy Leary debate at ASU. Wow. And it was really fun. It was super. I bet that would be very fun. interesting because yeah. Liddy, because I mean, he's he's an erudite. I mean, he can he can really. They were amazing. Oh yeah, yeah super no. fun. Yeah. And trying to talk them into going out for drinks after, you know, and was did super that. cool. <laughs> and did they? No, Timothy went out with but, you. Yeah, but G, uh, Liddy was. Um, yeah, yeah. I think he had a radio show at that point, yeah. and he was. Yeah. Like, I mean, he was super right wing, but very smart. Uh, articulate. Yeah, and, everybody's got a role, man. And so how in the heck did they put those two odds together? I think they, it's that's one of those cr- things where it's a yin and yang. Completely. I think without each other, they kind of, I, I came to this conclusion, without each other, they didn't really exist. Did they have Does any that, common ground at all? I, yeah, I think so. I think, I actually think they did. That yeah. common ground was that line in the middle. And I think people, like those guys would, I don't want to say playing roles, but they understood their positions. They knew what they wanted out of life. They, they, uh, you know, everybody knows what Liddy was doing. And so Liddy is for those who don't know her young. It has to do with Nixon and the Watergate, and Larry has to do with eating rats in prison. And, he, yeah, that's yeah. right. He was a tough guy. He said, "Don't mess with me." Period. Mm-hmm. And um, and nobody did. And he went to prison, and he wanted to go to prison because he wasn't going to talk. Um, and then Larry was the father of, though he wasn't really the father, but he. His claim to fame was the father, I guess, of LSD. He's a real proponent Open of LSD. your mind, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and a Yale professor. Was it and, Yale? Yeah, profi- I think it might have been. And, Harvard, s- I can't remember and so did you? So did you actually get to go have drinks with uh, Timothy? Yeah, Leary? but with a bunch of other people. Yeah, so cool. it was just a, a blast. You yeah. know, it was super cool. Just like, hey, look who we're with. You know. Yeah. And how old was Le- how old was he at that time? Was uh, Larry? I couldn't tell you. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You were a young kid. You were what? How old were you at this time? Probably like 23, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, it's that. interesting that at 23 you go, I'm going to go and listen to this. Because you must have known who those guys were. Yeah, but that's that, that whole aesthetic of, of um, like, look, if you listen to Black Flag or the Minutemen or any of that kind of Los Angeles, um, you know, punk, you know, the SST label, the Meat Puppets, any of that, you, you were really getting, like, I learned a lot from listening to The Clash, listening to the Minutemen about politics. And, yes. And, uh... Uh, so you that's were just aware, man, and you wanted to participate, you know, even if I was just doing a knucklehead, you know, in between party, you know, band thing. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I felt like the people that were doing it were doing a good enough job. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Where you go, like, yeah. you go see Black Flag and you go see the Minutemen, you go see, you know, Who's Do, Minor Threat, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like those people were foraging and like coming across the country, you know, and maybe making it in their van, maybe not. And it was all so you you had an affinity for those. You saw yourself kind of as one of those guys. I'm just curious, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're a very curious human being. Yeah, right? yeah. So am I. That's yeah. I think the bond that we have is we 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 don't uh, go a day without going. Hmm. I wonder why that's like yeah. that. I mean, if Allen Ginsberg was coming to town to read, who wouldn't want to go, even if you didn't like him? Yeah, Mrs. Ginsburg, maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. I don't know if there was a Mrs. Ginsburg. <laughs> I don't think there was. It was actually. a Mrs. Burroughs, and yeah. she didn't last long. Um, so after that, so then wh- where does your life progress after in your mid twenties, late twenties? Because you, you know, you make art, and you ma- you also make stands and things for art. Yeah. But you make your own art. When did that kind of awakening come as an artist? Was it in your twenties, thirties, or later? Or? Yeah, I think that was later. You know, I did a book thing for a while. What's and the book then, thing? Uh, just, I was working at a bookstore with some amazing people and I learned all sorts of things about, I think it was one of those things where I went to a bookstore in Tempe, bought some books, read them, and then brought them to a bookstore and uh, traded them. And then I got an enormous amount of trade and I wondered why. 
Mm. And I was like, you know, some Thomas Pynchon books and things like that that were, they were known, but they weren't super widely heralded, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're obviously landmarks in literature at this point. Yeah, because you like to read, right? Yeah, I've always liked to read. Yeah, and you've read a, a lot. And you went on this kind of sojourn, it sounds like. You were in, you were in your 30s when you went across 20s the 20s and 30s and whatever, you know, yeah, small tell, trips. And, yeah, tell us about some of the authors that you went to talk to and meet. Well, you know, we were under the impression that Henry Miller was still alive, but he wasn't. Yeah, so, <laughs> We went okay. to look for Henry Miller. Yeah. Ended up in Big Sur, but his friend Emma White was still alive. And and at the uh, Henry Miller Memorial Library. And I guess the memorial part should have tipped us off. Yes, but, yeah. <laughs> the guy let us camp out front. And all that kind of cool stuff where, you know, you just meet. Why, why don't you meet your the people that are influencing you? I don't want to call them heroes, but they kind of are. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're making things that are amazing. And Who would have been those heroes at that time that you literally went and said, I'm anybody, tracking down? Anybody we read, man. Anybody anybody that put out a record. Anybody that Do you I, remember some of the individuals that you yeah, went and like, met? Yeah, like, you know, we want to try to, we try, we try to find we. Cormac McCarthy. Who, who is we? Just punk rock knucklehead friends. Okay, friends. You know, that we're all, like, super creative. So you went to find McCarthy? By the way, we all had a penchant for running down streets with no clothes on. Yeah, yeah at stop signs. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was a reverse... Yeah, universe you were looking at this morning. It could be. <laughs> wasn't, it all back wasn't, yeah, it wasn't really anything. Yeah. So and so who who were some of the people that you tracked down? Well, we tried to track down Cormac McCarthy, but you know, he was, you couldn't find him. Um like after reading Blood Meridian, who doesn't want to meet that guy? Yeah. Yeah. Um so uh who were we? Like Harry Cruz was a big guy for us. Uh Jim Harrison we loved. Who just passed, right? Yeah, well a few years ago now, but he was down in southern Arizona. Yeah. Montana and Arizona, right? Uh, Michigan, and I think sometime in Montana, yeah. but that's where all his friends ended up, I believe. Mm -hmm. we what was he there. like? What was he like? He gruff, awesome, yeah, exactly what you'd want. Yeah, the, uh, the eye, you know, like the huge kind of larger than life uh -huh. individual. Um, and do you just knock on this guy's door and say, "Hey"? Well, you usually try to find them at a bar or something, and yeah. then like you know, you don't want to charm your way in, but you just see if something happens. Because mm -hmm. you, yeah, you want to get a glance at what's that guy look like, you know? I mean. Who wouldn't want to? You know have you mean? ever tried to write yourself? Yeah, I write. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What have you written? Uh, you know, I've written. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff, yeah. but excellent. Yeah, yeah. Poetry? Um, yeah, it's usually shorter form. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have the... Uh, I'm no David Foster Wallace, that's for sure. Yeah, and did you know him, by the way? No, but Because he was a two kid. He did his he master's here, right, in Tucson. Yeah, he was here for a while. Yeah. And uh, at one point, apparently, we shared a romantic interest... Um, so that was, uh, he's an interesting never, guy for those who don't know who that is. Yeah. He's an amazing yeah, writer he went down the Bourdain road though. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did go down um, the Bourdain road. Yeah. It's amazing how that has affected so many people that I know the Bourdain, you know, him checking out. Yeah. I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody does quite honestly. I think I understand it. I think, uh, I can't really, mm, no. Mm -mm. I guess I've never been at that point. You ever felt like, have you ever had a moment or a time when you were drowning? Like a real, there it goes, there's the emphasis. There it is. Oh. Drowning? Drowning. Uh, I've never yeah. drowned, but yeah, I've had one of those moments where it feels not so like this is a dangerous yeah, position. Yeah, I just wonder if. But not in I've, an emotional aspect like that, no. I've wrestled with that checking out. Yeah. That, uh, you know, check out times at 10.30. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I don't mind, you know, it's like, now that I have a family, that's out of the question, but. It's always been a in the back of your mind, you know, with all that information yeah. coming. It'd be nice if it was quiet, man. I asked my son about Bourdain and mm -hmm. that, and he said, "Hmm, yeah, maybe he just saw it all. He went everywhere. Maybe he just said he saw it all. Could be. That was it. Could be." <laughs> and I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but uh, I guess that's a possibility. One would assume it's deeper and darker than that. A friend of mine who does suicide um, specialty, he looks at those kind of things as being very. Um, selfish to the others and I can see that aspect too because you leave people you know Bourdain left a kid yeah you know and yeah I don't know if I can think of it in such rational terms I think uh, there's that time where uh, we don't none of us know what's on the other side so it's that you know like Bourdain one of does the, uh, he does now yeah I don't know if he's telling us yeah. um, there's a really cool book that a friend of mine and I were just talking about called the Japanese death poems mm. I think Tuttle put it out maybe um, and it's, uh, you know, Japanese, um, 
uh, people on their deathbed, uh, and it, like I suppose it's like a, um, almost a Dogon thing where you cook down your life to a few lines, mm. and uh, uh, um, and uh, it's that moment where you're going and you dictate your final thoughts, and uh, it's a fascinating, it's an amazing read because you know it's really distilled down to like this is. It's and they went and in, they went and interviewed. Uh, how did they get that? I think this is a tradition. I see. I think this is a tradition. So they took the, as you check out. Yep. You put it down. Well, somebody does it for you. Yeah. Because you're you know, you're kind of. Yeah, that's interesting. Seeing something that does else, sound maybe. fascinating. It's actually. an amazing thing. I'll yeah. kind of I'll find you a copy and bring well, it. Well, one would assume that may be the greatest moment of clarity. Yeah, it's the last haiku, man. Yeah, you know, you know that would have been a better title, probably. God, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, too late. That way, uh, too many people would know. Yeah, maybe. send me that. That actually does sound interesting. That'd be cool. I'll bring one in. So we've gone kind of dark and dirty here with the suicide and death. But let's get back. It's around. It is. <laughs> and it is a part of the creativity. I think you do see this in um, artists. You do. See, I, I, I've seen a lot of artists that have problems with depression and things like that for whatever reason. Don't know why. Yeah, I think um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the creative act has to do with destruction first. So, mm, yeah, um, you know, you're taking something that comes before you and learning from it and, in you know, metaphorically destroying it and making your own voice, which I'd. It's, you know, it's, I've never felt that need to um, completely destroy the, the things that came before, like rock and roll or whatever, you know, if you're yeah, a punk. Yeah, you, you keep doing it. I mean, you, 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 you do embrace it, it. Yeah. Do it your own way and say, you know, the guys in Led Zeppelin are not evil. Yeah. You know, but. Well, who says that? Well, you know, like back when I was growing up, they Oh, were. you did. Oh, were, I got know, it. Yeah, well, I was like, oh, those guys are major label and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I got it. Okay. But yeah. secretly, you know, and stealing from the blues and. Yeah, got it. You know, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet the guys, you know, and hang out. I don't particularly care for their what they're doing, but. Yeah, that comes with maturity, I think. Yeah. That you see other sides of the coin. Yeah. And all, you can embrace that. It's cool to see whatever, whatever, whatever anybody's doing. It's, yeah. It's, you know, and if if you after a while you feel like it's coming that straight out of like who they are, and there's no pretense, there's right. no cynicism, there's you know it's like beautiful. Like I met a guy last night, who we've been circling around each other for a long time at a at a friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, Michael Higgins. Mm -hmm. Tom Colaz came over. You know Tom? Mm -mm. He's like a real expert on on. Um, uh, uh, I would say, you know, it's like Mexican mask culture, I mm. guess I would call it. Yeah. And just passionately talked for like an hour yeah. about yeah, you gotta what love he was that. doing. Oh, it was so cool, man. You know, and to yeah. see that passion, it really coming from a, a genuine, super cool place in that guy's yeah. art, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, kind of trying to make sure that I understand that. Sounds the like I need that guy on my podcast. I would say so. <laughs> He's super cool. Uh, all of those people, it, you know. They've all been yeah, well, that's part of the deal of this podcast is try to find those people that have something to say. Yeah. And hopefully teach other people, too, I think, about creativity and what you can do with your life. It's not all about making money. It's not all about making commercial art. Sometimes it's just about making. Yeah. And so you've done that. One of the things you've you've made art, you've been making art, what well, art, art, not, not just your stance. Because Jeff, you know, I think the first when I originally met Jeff, it was to make stands for my art, and he still does that. He's fantastic, mm -hmm. by the way. That's you how we feed a, the family. Yeah. So if you need to get a stand made for your art, talk to Jeff. <laughs> we can get you the information. Um, but the uh, art, art that you make, what I would consider, you know, your um, pieces that are metal and you know the, the stuff yeah stuff talk about that when did you start making what i would call fine art oh, i don't know i, I don't i could because you had influences there too you worked with an artist that affected you yeah i worked yeah. it was super cool enough to be through bishop gallery in scottsdale from bill bishop and peter lewis and i was um met those guys through books and uh they introduced me to Fritz Scholder, who needed help at that point. So I ended up helping Fritz Scholder for a while. And how long ago was that, would you say? Let's say before 2000. So you were I helping Fritz with making stands for him and things like no, that? or just, just being work, around the studio around and doing him. what he needed to do and move things. and uh, Assistant, maybe? Would yeah, that be? I would call it yeah. lazy assistant. And how, yeah, and how long did you work with Fritz? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe a couple of years. Oh, maybe. a long time then. No, not really, because it was sporadic. Yeah. It was like and just how, what, was he, it. what was he like? It's very it's interesting because awesome. because you know his name keeps coming up in these podcasts. Really, it's a thread that con continually. Well, Julie, 
who you had, Julius Assey, yeah. you had a relationship with him uh, artistically through the Elaine Horowitz. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So many people did. So what was so? Give me a, what your take is at Fritz Scholder. What kind of a human artist person was he? Did well, you work with here's him? a dude. Okay, um, I've always had a lot of questions because um, you know I'm, I have a lot of friends in the Native American community, and they've always got questions about what he was like. And here's a cool thing: um, I was married before and this marriage, and I was very depressed. I came in to help him, and uh, he just looked at me. and was like, hey, man, what's up? I said, oh, man, lots of stuff going down. You know, an old girlfriend has returned, right. and she's a yeah. junkie, and you know, like, right. I love her, and yeah. my marriage is falling apart, and blah, blah, blah. Right. And uh, he's like, okay, fuck it. I'm going to go get some beer. I'm going to go get <laughs> it, and we're just going to talk, and I'll get some pizza. And that was it. We were set to, like, he was set to, you know, do what he does, paint right. and do what, you know, and he just stopped everything. Because he took the time to notice you were that pain. I was not yeah. a, a happy camper, and uh, that wasn't just once. I mean, he would he would notice things, and like we had this relationship where um, criticism, critique day, where he would say, "Hey Jeff, why don't you come in on Thursday and uh, bring what you're working on?" This is really cool, man. I mean, to have his yeah. eye. So I would come in and have a few things, and he had a little round table set up in a studio. I don't remember if it had like a drape over it, but it was a round table and two, two chairs. One was pushed in and one was pulled out. I was to come in and put the things on and skedaddle, get out. Of course, I would spy on him and yeah. look through and he'd right. be like picking things up and I would leave. He'd go in. So these are the more kind out. of sculptural objects that you're making? Yeah, yeah, tangible, really, you know, yeah. tactile, Organic hands-on stuff. things. And at that point, I was making really shamanic yeah. type material. Which, which he could relate made. to, for sure. Yeah. I mean, because he did that whole shaman series. He was, he was, he yeah. was one. So in my consideration, um, uh, and I was to return after a while, you know, he'd give me, he'd give me an hour or whatever. And I'd go in and you have three piles. One was forget it. One was okay. Keep working on it. These are great. So the three piles and the forget it pile was really obvious. You know, it's like, right. Yeah, I knew I was and would he junk. explain why this is okay? Yes and no. Working. Very, very vague. Or was it just here it is. You can figure it out. That kind of thing, but he would talk about you know like what do you, you know why did you use this? Why did you? It was more questions and more making me work than. So it came from that teacher background that he yeah, had because he taught at AIAI. Yep. Back in the day, and so how fast could he? You know, I always people always ask me, oh, well, how long did it take you to make this painting? And sometimes it takes an artist very little time to make a painting. That it takes a lifetime to make it. Yeah. Th thank you. That's exactly right. Yep. It's like a surgeon. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to take out that uh, appendix? Well. Took me about uh, eh, twenty five minutes, but yeah. took me a lifetime. <laughs> use a scalpel or a butter yeah. knife. <laughs> yeah, well, it used to be the scalpel. Now it's just a. Um, but so how how fast would he work? What was his process? Could he get something done in you know in a day? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the really cool things about him was it was very. I mean, he would do things in public where you could see they were. I don't think they were ever you know that great, but it was a really cool opportunity to see somebody who could really paint paint. Um, I could never do that with an audience, but he would. Um, ironically, he's, during the day, he would be on the phone. He would be doing things. Every once in a while, he'd come out and ask you know, for help with something. But I've never seen, literally, I've never seen somebody get so much done in a day. Okay, And then it would be, Jeff, go grab me, because he had old paintings that we would paint over, and then he would paint again on them. And I never stretched a canvas for him. Hmm. He would just use old paintings he didn't like? That's, yeah. Interesting. Like yep. old, old paintings? Yeah, it was very fun to paint over his signature. and Wow. I mean, just, you know, I, so there's all periods. Yeah, so there's a little note. I mean, take a look at your painting. It may be, there may be a two-for-one there. Yeah, <laughs> more than likely. Yeah. Um, how often did he do that, where he paint over these things? Uh, in my experience, I was uh, often, I guess. Did he talk about why he would do that? Did mm -hmm. he say? No, he just did it. Yeah. Yes, no. Well, a, you know, it's like it's like a, my attitude about a lot of things I create too. There's a time and a place, and once that time and a place is done, it's kind of just a document, and it's not up to me or it's more up to you to determine whether or not that document means something. Mm -hmm. um, for me, there's a purpose for making things, and I think probably I can't speak for him, and I wouldn't want to, but I just saw him do what he did. I never saw him paint, dude. I never saw him paint. It was one of those things where I would leave and uh, I'd come back a few days later and there'd be a bunch of stuff done. Hmm. 
So it was like, whoa, you know, and then I would just like have a nice time looking and sweeping and, you know, yeah. rearranging. Just absorbing. Yeah. And he, he did this cool thing. I always try to talk him into putting it out. Was he just recorded himself growling. <laughs> I always wanted a record of that. Yeah. Like a, like a right. 12 inch record with just like, I don't know, like a black cover just or something. I literally just. Uh, yeah. yeah. I always like, why was he doing that? Out? I don't know. Why not? Well, I can think of a lot of reasons, <laughs> but <laughs> why are we sitting here talking yeah. today? <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, was it more of a release kind of a thing? Yeah, uh-huh. just, who knows? It just I just loved it. Yeah, and it, that was that a regular thing he would do? Mm, I don't, I don't think so. It was just he one just time. He was just yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, he just but he just did, guy, he had a he had like a rack of CDs, and I would see what he's listening. I was Jesus, really, Dylan, Good dude, come on, man, <laughs> Dylan, and you know everybody loves him, whatever. Yeah. Um, See, it is still in there. <laughs> it's like to him this morning, I was listening to our local KXCI, which is a great station, community station, stuff like that. But I'm not a like a singer-songwriter type guy with affected voice. You know, yeah. I like just a regular, I don't need a whiskey-soaked person <laughs> telling me some, a story about milk I'm supposed soaked. to wrap my mind around. Yeah. Um, that's going to affect my hearing. For so the rest his of the music day. wasn't your taste. No, no, but you know, most music isn't. Um, and everybody's boat is floated by different water. I guess mm-hmm. you know, it's a, like a dad saying. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but my dad um, you never know, said I, that. I don't my, think. One of my <laughs> I think he said, "Well, it's float your boat." That I yeah. heard. Yeah, that's a good something one. like that. You know, speaking of floating your boats, it took. I don't want to digress too much, but your brother's a badass dude. Yeah, don't don't get your yeah your. Uh, <laughs> You go up there, Ned. So yeah, my brother's a musician, and yeah. he he runs to his own beat too. And now he's doing, you know, he's doing some fantastic uh, Cuba trips down. And you know, if you want to really get into music and understand it, then I highly encourage you go to my brother's. I don't know how you get a hold of him because no one seems to be able to. But if you call me or contact me, I can get you Ned Sublet's information for his Cuba trips. And yeah, yeah he's, cool he's but he's an interesting cat. He's been yeah. doing that for a long time, right? Yeah, forty years. Yep. Yeah. So he knows. He knows all the guys. None of this new... And he's a good musician and great writer and great. that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So he definitely... Uh, those are... He's got one coming up, I know, in February. I may even go to. Yeah. So if he can handle me. I don't know if he can handle me. I don't know, man. <laughs> Your little brother showing up. <laughs> Say that again. That's one of the things I'd like to talk with you about is like this... Uh, this you, you, Just two of you, right? Do you have a sister? No, we have... Yeah, no, there's four of us. Oh, four of yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're all probably super successful like you two, right? Super. Well, they're all driven. Yeah, Every, driven. Everybody's driven. I think yeah. that's the word. That's a good dynamic to like. I'd like to. Yeah, and I don't know why that is. You know, it wasn't like something that was in our family. So you, it was just kind of you. Yeah, you, we expect you to do your thing and go on. Yeah. Everyone was did their thing and went on. We we're all kind of gone. Yeah. You know, my sister left probably at fifteen or maybe sixteen. My brother about the same. Other sister, fifteen. I stayed till I was eighteen because I was having fun. Yeah. So no, let me graduate on time. I don't want to. I don't need to graduate two years early. <laughs> Why? Well, you should go on college. You've got college and postgraduate to do. Well, let me enjoy. I'll enjoy high school. High school's yeah. fun. So yeah, everybody else like you know, my brother and two of my brother. My brother and my sister went to New York, and you know they've been there for forty years. And yeah. My sister's in Scottsdale. Hi, Amy. Saying hi to you. Hey, there's, there's hi, your, Amy. Hey, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you on the show. We'll talk about how I fed you med pies that one day. <laughs> Not mud pies, med pies? <laughs> <laughs> no, they were mud. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we digress. We're going on That's to Mark awesome. Sublet's life, which is not that interesting as in this podcast because it's about it's, it's you. It's a dialogue. It's, Mark. A, it's about Jeff. And so you work with Fritz for mm-hmm. quite, and who else? What other artists did you work with? Uh, let's see. Um, well, through that gallery and through Bill uh, Bishop and Peter Lewis, uh, I met Leonard Baskin, who was a huge influence and like a huge influence on Fritz, and they worked did things together and. So through this gallery, it was like a real hands-on, like meeting people, like meeting people like that and yeah, having artists. working relationships rather than, you know, glancing across the room at your favorite author or something and then maybe having a talk with them or going yeah. to their place or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to read William Burroughs. It's another thing to watch him read or stand next to him and talk to him. It's super cool, you know, because mm-hmm. there's like so much experience there to enjoy and... 
and you could add your, your life. Yeah, and I guess and you could add something to that to that mix with your own creative bent and what you bring to it. I, I'm assuming. Yeah, I always wondered. You know, I, always, I was whenever I had the opportunity to hang out with somebody who's that accomplished and that uh, driven, um, I always kind of broach that question and we could say, hey, you know what, what do you get out of me being here? And it's like, youth, usually youthful exuberance was the, <laughs> the thing. Is that, you know, like, you know, like a lot right. of these folks were running out of energy and like they've done something for a long time and to have somebody come along that was young or even, you know, our age now, it was like, dude, you know, that line in that one book, it's like, wow, how'd you come up with that? And it's like, whoa, you really read that quite cool. Right, you know, you and, care. Yeah, and like, um, one of my favorite things to listen to. You ever listen to Michael Silverblatt Mm-mm. interview authors? Oh, Mm-mm. dude, so cool. So yeah, like if anybody like, likes literature and likes you know, like somebody being interviewed super in depth about what they do, like look up Michael Silverblatt. And does, so he, do, awesome. does he do it on a podcast? Kind of. Yeah, he's been doing it for a long time, you know. And uh, and uh, yeah, one he's more got, podcast to add to my. <laughs> I think he does it on a podcast, but he's like radio shows. For yeah, the most I'm sure part. it's done. But you can get them all on YouTube and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll definitely check it They're out. They're super good. Well, I mean, to me, writers are just like artists too. They are usually introverts. They're deep. Um, they work in a very solitary profession mm-hmm. that requires self motivation and um, to succeed. Or even not to succeed, just to do it. I mean, just so many. To get it done. Yeah, so I, that would be interesting to hear. I think there would be a th- common thread, a duality between artists because they are the same artists that make art and writers and probably musicians. I think there's a this singular thread that runs through. I think some people like yourself have taken it as your almost your mantra is create and curiosity. Um, and now you worked also. And because most of the time you've worked into by yourself doing your own thing, but you also worked at the herd, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it just you know um, piecemeal work going up, and when they had uh, when they were usually behind on a schedule of opening a show, or you know, like when home the home exhibit, which is their, their flagship exhibit, mm-hmm. been, I think for a while now. Um, I did that in 2005 and met a lot of cool people. One of the and you'd make stands for the baskets and that's, I did the whole thing. And, and things jewelry like that. and you know textiles and pottery and the whole deal. And it was like a, a pretty intense environment, you know. And the people up there are awesome. Phil, the carpenter, super cool. Um, Manuelita Wheeler, who's uh-huh. like the director of the Navajo Nation Museum, he was my boss up there. And, was he named after Manuelita? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, great Manuelita. He's a badass, too. Oh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Navajo Star Wars is he and his wife's project. Oh, yeah, which was very cool. I saw yeah. that. Yeah. For those who uh-huh. don't know, they put Navajo to the Star Wars. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you can still go out and find it, but it's from pretty... From the ground up, dude, from like yeah. you know, the, those emails to Lucas Studios. Yep. and they, 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 I watched it during so Indian cool. Market, just filled with... There was like three white guys in there, which was fantastic, and people were screaming and yelling. That's and, awesome. Yeah, and it's a different experience for sure. But the persistence of his, of his idea, and I remember in 2005 when I met him, I was working at the herd, you know, like crazy, bloody fingers, you know, like tie, you know, we're gonna open this thing, and right. late nights and people's ten, you know, tension between people, and I kind of like that, you know, because it's like a, an environment where we can all rise together, unless you're a naysayer, and you're yeah, like, oh, go away. But uh, Manny would come in with like, hey, dude, I got this idea with, you know, taking Star Wars and making it a Navajo, you know. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that idea, yeah. buddy. Good luck with <laughs> that That is, when you think about how incredibly out the box that is, first of all, you're going to have to go through the corporate hoops with Lucas and everything else. And he did. And guess what? Yeah. During halfway through the project, it became a Disney property. Oh wow! So he had to like switch all over to Disney. The yeah. Two oh yeah, because behemoths, it, because you know? Disney bought Lucas. Yeah. yeah, bought the Star Wars franchise. Yeah, that's right. So I think halfway through that's the project, that's pretty cool that Lucas went for that and did that. I think that says a lot about him, actually. Could be in a very positive way. Yeah, you yeah. know, to see that because uh, it brought an unusual uh, essence to that movie that you couldn't ever have gotten. It's amazing that guy saw that that was important to do. Yeah. And uh, so you met him, you worked with him, and then you also worked at Arizona State Museum for a while, too, making uh, here in Tucson, yeah, right? Yeah. Yep, for a couple, three years, maybe. And so... That was a panic move. Yeah. By the way, everyone, I had a family. I remember it. <laughs> you I were... need money. <laughs> do you have anything for me to make? Um, we ran into each other at a land art movie. 
Yeah, we did. Yep. Yeah, which I'm a big fan of land art, and so are you. You, yeah. Tell us uh-huh. a little bit about how th- that has influenced you. Have you gone to Tur- Have you met Terrell and that kind of thing? Uh, yeah. I've never met him, but I've been up, you know, around that stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure. I, I. Here comes the dick in me. <laughs> I'm not so sure the. Uh, I don't know, man. It's it's, it's too exclusive. Like, you know, not the dude that works, group. Like, like not the dude that works at Home Depot can go up there and check it out. You yeah. got to make an appointment. You got to do all this. I don't know if I'm hip to that. Like the Michael Heiser stuff that's way out in the middle of nowhere. And yeah. That dude's a badass. I have a picture of him on my, on my wall of like standing in front of that tied earth piece when yeah. he's like got like super cool jeans on and, and he- just standing there. Yeah, Heiser did the, uh, the big rock that's at LACMA. Yeah. Which the suspended is, thing. Yeah, which is just genius in my opinion super genius and what's even more genius is like the procession of bringing a rock into LA. i watched it yeah super cool yeah they had to move trees <laughs> shut down things and which know. of course you know it goes back i watched to the, it it was on like the internet i watched it here it comes people would line the streets and yeah if you haven't gone to lacma and that's in la the la county museum and go see the i forget the title of them do you remember the title it's an interesting title oh, i don't remember i should know I have it. pictures of it in my phone yeah Anyway, you but won't they need a t- on it. You won't need a title because it's the biggest rock outside, and it's outside suspended the museum, over a <laughs> and it's suspended over a, a tunnel, a and pathway. it's you know highly encourage you just go absorb that. Yeah, and I think uh, the panic of the uh, the engineers to put the, the steel structures underneath the stone it does take away from it, but you but still, do it. yeah, yeah, because it's earthquake country. Yeah, you can't really. This thing's monstrous. It's huge, and, and it is cool. So that one's accessible. Yeah, some things aren't accessible with land art. Things like the uh, going to New Mexico to see the lightning fields. It's very, you know, you have to get, I don't know, two years in advance to go see that. Yeah. Have you done that? I have. Yeah, yeah, that's oh. cool. Oh, yeah. Not much happened, but it's just super cool when yeah. the sun sets and the light hits. And Which is kind of the whole point of it, isn't it, I think? Uh, that I mean, you can get that from sitting in your backyard with your your loved ones, and the sun hits the yeah. right way. You know that time yeah. in Tucson where but the, I think part pops of it's orange. The process of getting out there and being be. alone, making an effort. Yeah, I mean, you grew up in Vermont, so you're used to being in the wilderness. And you know, yeah. I grew up in New Mexico, and you know, we're used to wide open spaces. But for some people, they're never going to go to a place where there's just no human beings for just jackrabbits and coyotes, yeah. you know? And for them, I think that's maybe even a bigger experience. Yep. You, know, it's, you know, you go and go, I hope I get lightning hits one of these things. I want to catch it or a yeah. big storm or comes nothing. through. Like just for, to go and have a nothing experience is as important yeah. as yeah. having like, a, you know, that. that kind of uh, like this. Oh my God, we saw a flying yeah. dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. But having that like, you know, where you can just sit and there's literally, you know, that little weird buzz in your ears because of the hearing damage and, and then that goes away after a while, and 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 I sometimes I really like this nothing. Mm. Like there's no thing, there's no judgment. It's like you know taking you out, like dude, let's go out hiking, and you know if sunset's awesome, whatever's happening in the sky, and all of a sudden you're like, dude, if that if that mountain was moved a little to the right, I think it would be better. <laughs> there's no criticism available to you. Yeah, I like that. Uh-huh. You know, so it's that. Um, like you say, I mean, just driving on 10 or 40 or whatever in those big, long stretches and, like, you know, going through Zuni or whatever. And you have those moments where, like, that's that oneness where I understand why I'm here and there's nothing. Yeah. It's fantastic. That's I'm when just, you put in an moving. Audible book and listen to a Charles Bloom no, murder mystery. No, you do <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could my just one plug put of that my in book. your lap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I find, that, you know, I actually wrote one of those books coming back from Santa Fe to mm-hmm. Tucson with that same thing. I wrote the whole book in my head. I was going to say in your head, you're not writing and yeah. driving, are you? Yeah, no, I would never do that. It's okay. a lot, I think. Okay. Um, but yeah, and it was that nothingness that allowed me to focus in yeah. with the occasional, you know, geographic stimulus going by. But there is something to be said about just nothing. It's cool, you know, yeah. when you're following like the dude, uh, the um, the trail of uh, what's the Dennis Hopper movie with the motorcycles? Yeah, 
uh, you know, mid, I was going to say Midnight Cowboy. Yeah, it's a different one. <laughs> Easy Rider. Thank you. So, like, you know, when we did that Easy Rider thing where you go, like, find the, you know, the guy in Flagstaff, the, right. the, 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 lumber guy, uh, the lumberjack. And there's one that's just like it here in Tucson. So everybody's like, they go to the, the automotive place. And, right. Hey, is that the one that's in Easy Rider? Like, right. Oh, we don't no. think so. But, an, but you end up at that place where um, they pick up um, the... The commune guy that doesn't want to answer questions about yes. his past. Super cool. Yes. Uh, Porky Pig. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, they're in that, the ruins. I think it's Wapaki or Wakoki yeah, ruins, I think. Was. Yeah. So when we were on that, that being like tracing that and then being there at sunset, and all of a sudden you realize, like, yeah, the Easy Rider thing's cool about that, whatever. That's cool. And you're sitting on them and you know, have some respect. And But then you look out and you see that quiet. The move, the, the, the moisture moving through the air that's got shape. <laughs> Real slow. Well, one of my and, clients was a good friend with Dennis Hopper, and he, he said he'll come on at some point in time, so we'll talk all about Dennis he's Hopper. He's going to drag Dennis Hopper on here? Uh, not him, okay. but he's going <laughs> he's going to channel him. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Dennis is dead. We're going to bring some of those cool And Dennis is interesting, too, in the sense that he was a Warhol fan. You know, he's into photography. He was into the whole Native American movement in the 60s and 70s. Anybody you know, that was buddies with Wallace Berman is okay with me. Yeah, I mean, he was he was the spokesperson of the that generation, the hippie generation to some extent for that movie was that. If you haven't seen the movie, for those that are out there who haven't, you better go see it. Yeah. You know, Peter Fond is the other one. There's a great uh, podcast actually on uh, Mark Maron. I'll plug you, Mark. I'm assuming you'll plug me back, but he uh, interviewed Peter Fonda and they talked about that movie, awesome. which is very interesting as well. Cool. Yeah, flawed masterpiece, man. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. perfect American art. Yeah, especially for that time frame. Yeah. Yeah, because it yeah. was crazy time frame. And people, I think people don't give enough uh, like credit to the people that were all in that, too. Like the ranchers that were playing along, yeah. you know, and like, what's Dude? You know, what's, oh, Dude Ranch, you know, like, right. cool guy. Right. Um, like Tony Basel, I think is, yeah. how, how you say your last yeah. name? Mm -hmm. Super accomplished, awesome artist, man. Yep. You know, you look at, you know, yeah, hey, Mickey, you're so fine, but. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of depth behind that. Yeah. A lot of cool depth. That was a good song, too, by the way. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Maybe I'll see if I can get it to be able to and play you know, it. It's not craft work, but. <laughs> yeah, make it so fine. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, so now tell us a little bit of what's going on now in your life as far as where, what are you doing today as far as creating, writing, making, you know, you're doing your stands. Just making your stands is an important part of your component of life, right? Helps yeah, that's it. how we eat. Yeah. A portion of how we eat. And when you make those, I want to actually ask you some questions about that. And by the way, the, the, the Bishop Gallery people are the ones that got me on that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Somebody had knocked over a piece of sculpture in their place, and I liked it. And it was like maybe a Dogon piece. I see. You, you know? liked the piece that was broken or I whatever. did. And, and they and, I, and Bishop Bish asked if he said, hey, man, uh, you think you can fix this? Since your work looks old, and I said, yes. eh, probably, I'll give it a shot, thinking right. that I'll fix it, and they'll like it, and then they'll give it to me because I, you know. Because <laughs> you want it. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of greed there, but right. it's a super cool piece. Right. And so I did. I worked on it, and, uh, you know, um, kept in mind that you, whatever you do, you kind of make it reversible, and, you know, f you know, like, just put it back together. Yes. And, uh, and I made a mount. I remember it was Thanksgiving Day. My father and Dan Neese, a friend of ours. We were all standing out there. It was an awesome steady cam guy, filmmaker. Um, we were standing out on Thanksgiving Day trying to figure out how to weld. Yeah. It was like a spot welder, yeah. <laughs> like a MIG. And uh, I made it, brought it back, and thinking, oh, cool, you know, they're probably going to give it to me. Right. And I was like, hey, man. They liked it and said, hey, what, uh, What's what do we owe you? Yeah. The piece? I don't know. <laughs> like to have Give me the piece. Exactly. They said some stupid number, and they gave it to me. And, yeah. and he said, hey, let's go out for a walk after lunch. Let's go to lunch, and we'll talk about something. And, uh, and uh, you know, after, after the end of that walk, I had 30, 40 objects to work on from wow. other galleries. And that was making... And so when you get an object, is there... Do you feel some kind of sensibilities to that piece? In other words, you know... I know when I certain objects that I buy have a mana. There's something mm -hmm. there. There's something that I can feel. Yep. It sounds crazy, whatever. But there's some kind of essence to that object. Hopefully. Yeah. Do you feel those kind of things? And do you make the stands around that so 
No. It has nothing. It's only visuals. You just go, okay, the visually, this is the best way it would look or that. Or do you go, this is how I envision this piece being shown sure. or displayed? There's kind of a journey that goes with it. First, you um, consider the person who wants it done. Ah, I like That's that. the first yeah, thing. That makes sense. Um, because if they want to do something specific with it, show it in a certain place, um, or show it in a way that they're not considering gravity, mm -hmm. um, or the safety of the thing that they're planning on you yeah. know, living with, right? Or and you let them by, know, say, "Hey, this could be dude, yeah, problematic." Yeah, we got to take into consideration gravity here. Yeah, um, or lighting. Or yeah, whatever. some people don't think about that. It's important. We and have to do this in the gallery too. By the way, you'll get a sculpture that might have like arrows or spears in it and you go okay this is eye level let's move it up or let's put it yeah. in a corner or something yeah. and i think sometimes i don't know if i don't know if sculptors ever think about those things they when should. they're making it but they should mm -hmm. because it does affect whether you and that's what comes through with your mojo that you were talking about yeah see and that's something that i kind of I'm very i would say critical about it but you can accept mojo when it's there and it's like and not not a lot of things have it mm. um um but when you do feel it, it's a cool thing, you know. Like you know, it's a, it's like wow, that's you know, everything was thought about, like um, age, how it's gonna be shown, how it's gonna last, how it's gonna, and what it's saying, and how it's gonna yeah. influence, and blah blah blah. But um, so to answer your question more in depth, um, when you're working with an object, it's first the person um, that's bringing it to you or asking about it. Second is the, 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 the skeletal structure of the object itself. It's generally if you deviate from the skeletal structure of the object, of the object, you're blowing it. Yeah, it's like the, or you a could or you could damage it too, right? Well, you never damage an object. Yeah, um, you but, just don't. But I could see you doing that if you tried to force it to be in a certain situation or position that, it, again, gravity is not its friend. Yeah, I mean, you know, even if you're mount, even if you're working with an old McDonald's cup, yeah, you know, from a Happy Meal, it may mean something to that person, and you try as hard as you can not to, you know, stumble over your stoop on the way into the house. Have you ever <laughs> worked with an old McDonald's cup? No, but I've worked with Barbies and stuff before. Yeah, like a collection of Barbies and you know, just weird, you know. Things was that, that any different for you making those than it was, you know, skeletal structure, man? Yeah, it's you still got whatever enjoyment out of that as much as you would have been working with it. No, it's like that when it comes back to my nothingness, there's no enjoyment. There's no, it's just doing yeah. the thing for the, for the work. For you the know? object. Yeah. It's, um, I, you know, I guess enjoyment would be, I, you know, I like doing it. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think I have a, seen you come in with a piece. You go, Oh, I'm really happy with this. This really turned out what I really like. And I can see an excitement and joy yeah. in your face on that object that you made. Yeah. For the for the stand. Now maybe it wasn't fun making the stand, or it was more mechanical, and that's what you do. But I can see it in your face when you succeed. There's yeah, there's certain successes yeah. that I think you can be very proud of because what you're trying to do is like remain anonymous. Mm, I like, like that. Hence the name. Like, hey, don't use my real name. Yeah. Kind of a like wherever I've worked is kind of leave no trace, and to the, the trace that you want to leave is like the safety of the thing that you're working with and the inspiration of the people that. We'll see whatever you've done. So it's kind of cool to remain a zero in the equation. And I really like that. Mm. I really like that. Like, um, like I'm the super lazy assistant of, of a guy called Olivier Mosse. He's a Swiss uh, radical minimalist painter. Right. He's super inspired awesome you guy. somewhat in your, work, your own work, wouldn't you say? I would say that um, he's given me opportunities that inspire mm. Like I was saying in my, uh, whenever we um, have shown together or show together with a third person or something, like what I try to do is, A, look at what they're doing, look at the space, and kind of create a dialogue for the evening. And, uh, and, and if the pieces last beyond that is a very good positive thing, but it's not up to me. My focus is like the interaction of us. Mm. Like our social sculpture right now, the conversation we're having could be super cool. I could just break down in tears and be like, dude, what's I'm wrong? Open. <laughs> that would be really good views. You know, we call each other names. We could, yeah, you know, no, tongue happens. kiss, whatever, you know. It's like <laughs> it, you create what's that, that and what you, the memory that you leave behind or what you take from it 
could be a painting, could be these super cool things behind us. I don't focus on those so much. Um, so I, that therein lies my problem. Therein lies the rub, is that to make things for me is a very specific set of circumstances because there's already enough shit in the world. Mm. You know, do I really need to make something else? Yeah. Um, so, so creating moments is super cool for me. Yeah. Like a land art thing where you go out there for the first moment and you see um, Nancy Holtz, you know, tube, yeah. you know, like the concrete tubes and the light right. thread. You can't take those with you. They're not going to fit in your car. Yeah. So you can what only, you're doing is taking that moment. Yeah. Well, and there's different ways to take it. Some people take it just, they listen, they think, they see. Others immediately just go click, 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 and click, 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 and move yeah. on. One cool. of my favorite imagery to watch is when I go to a museum uh, especially Starry Night, I mean, by Van Gogh. And you always, there's always a crowd of people. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be 20, could be 50. None of them are looking at the painting. Mm-hmm. They all are going click, 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 or maybe like this. Yeah. And I'm always, I, I like to just sit back and wonder why people don't look at the painting. They're looking at their phones taking the picture of the image. And if I'm going to take a picture, it's actually going to be of the crowd taking the picture. Yeah. Because I think that's, to me is amazing or when you go to a museum and they go here here's the thing you got to listen to it and i'm and i i remember doing this once and saying i don't need that well you're not how are you going to know about the paintings or you know enjoy the experience i'm like i'm gonna look at it (laughs) and then you go in and everybody's listening to the thing and nobody's in fact they're doing like this they're looking down they're not listening or concentrating on what the words are saying and not actually looking at the object it's a shame um, and that comes with, I think, exposure, education. Yeah, that's right. Um, it brings me back to that conversation you had with Robert Summers a couple of your podcasts ago, which I think was a super cool one. I, I like a lot of them. I like how cool Shanto was. He's a super cool <laughs> guy. And he's an awesome guy. Yeah. Um, um, we watched him read children's stories before have his books. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. My girls, wonderful. I have two girls, um, and they loved it. Yeah. They're super cool. Um, but the Robert Summers, I'd like to address this with you. As you guys were talking about the responsibility of gallerists and like keeping young people interested, yes. and, and uh, as when I was listening to you guys talk or listening to the conversation, I thought to myself, um, they're missing something important. Which I think, um, let's just use like your brother's situation in New York City in, in the, the late seventies, middle seventies, into when he's still there, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, when he was creating guitar music. There's a scene, there's like, you know, like um, all of the graffiti that was coming up, all of it, but they all knew each other and they were all like a group of people. Yes. Okay. And, and communicating. Fortunately for that group of people, they became super, they were driven, they became taken ser- they were taken seriously, you know, like Dondi's work. And for me, Ramel Z is the badass of the crew with all of that crazy stuff he was talking about. He listened to him speak and... Wow, that guy's on a, di- on a different level of understanding mm-hmm. of making things. Really, uh, you know, like the, the inclusion of language and, and his graffiti and like how, you know, yeah. letters were attacking each other and, and just, whoa, you know, that brings you to a different level of understanding. But you have a community there that's feeding on each other and the people that are buying art are around that community. They're yeah. communicating with those people. So when Robert was talking about going to dinner with the individuals who had sold their businesses for you know, yeah, great, young guys, great sums of money, right? And not having art, I think they just don't know people, and that's right. And it's a weird thing where you know, like we're all um, we, the communities are being kind of more co-opted by screens, like mm-hmm. you say, people taking photographs yep. of of Van Gogh rather than knowing their no their local Van Gogh, mm-hmm. you know, um, and to reintroduce that sense of community and things spinning around each other, like having record stores open, having bookstores yeah. open, having places where people go. And, you know, hey, I'm I'm as guilty as all of us going on Amazon and finding some weird, rare poetry book from Japan, you know. Yeah. Yeah, what you're going to send me. Click. Yeah. I'll take that. Um, but I'd rather go down, you know, and I've exhausted the local or Phoenix or Los Angeles. Yeah, but you, you know, you get the book from Amazon, but you come and talk about it on the podcast, and maybe that develops some kind of sense of community around, if nothing else, around this podcast. Yeah. You know, and Which that's a very cool thing about the podcast. Yeah, there's one of the reasons I want to do it is because I want to build that sense of understanding what I do, what I see, what I feel yeah. has, it's not just me, yeah. right? 
It's yeah. the guy who makes my stand. It's the guy who makes beautiful poetry that I get to listen to. You know, it's the person who somehow adds to my life, uh, creativity from a creative standpoint, but also from a curiosity standpoint. And I think that's what art and literature and music's all about anyway, mm -hmm. are those things. For my business specifically, which is dealing more in Native American Western art, it is one that's changing rapidly, and we have to get other people that are interested, whether it's you know, the United States of America or Tokyo, Japan. It's know? an interesting thing because I think when there's a dig, would it be a dichotomy? You help me with this one. Where um, you have amazing things here. Like mm -hmm. we're out in the gallery looking around. I'm like, just like, whoa, that's got serious. Yeah. That's cool. Or, you know, that's a nice painting. I, you know, it's nice to look at. Um, there's all different levels of things. But when you have a young couple coming in that come in here because they got a coffee or they didn't know you were here, right. it's hard for them to get into the game because the game is expensive. Depends on, you know, we always make sure we have. Yep, entry yeah. level things. So and people you do. Can do. Yeah, I've always prided myself in that. But I think, in what you and Robert were talking about, there is that community aspect that's missing. Where you may have something affordable, but I don't know who is this guy. You know, it's like it's not like I can have coffee with them unless I meet them in here. And so there's like that support system, which was very punk rock, very um, getting in a van and touring over the country mm -hmm. when you had no money and. And you build systems of trust and mm -hmm. systems like we had an open door policy to any bands coming through town. They knew where the yeah. keys were. Some of that still exists, though. Oh, of course it does. Yeah, I mean, I see my son building that down, you know, in the music scene down. Yeah, you know. And your son's twenty some. 20, yeah, he's twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah. So um, he, there's another generation that we look at that are, and imagine being a twenty five year old today, where um, like, dude, I could go see William Burroughs. I could. I never saw Kerouac. I was, it was too too far gone, but. You know, you go see people like that, Bukowski, and mm -hmm. these just different people um, reading. Um, you go see, like, Leslie Marmon Sulko or somebody. And they can do that, though, through the Internet, through YouTube. Through, it's, it's not I know the it's, same. But man. it's not. It's different. Yep. But at the same time, it's exposure. It and is. you can see more. Yeah. You know? But your, your, your aspect of going through a journey to get to the lightning field is the same as going yeah. to see Sherman Alexie rant. Which yeah. is a cool thing to see. Or yeah. coming into Medicine Man Gallery to, you know, and not just looking on the website. It's important. You know, walk yeah. in, see it, smell it, touch it, it's get important. a chance to actually talk to maybe me or somebody that might have a passion about it and provide that passion to other people. And that's a super cool thing about you and, and the people that you have here. Uh, it's so open. You know, yeah. your knowledge no. is yeah, deep. Well, that's why, you know, that's why I do my YouTube videos. That's why I do this is educate, engage. You know, and hopefully people are going to get it just like you get life. Uh -huh. You know, you're a creative person. You have dedicated your life to creativity wherever that may take you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes you on a weird route. But, you know, ultimately it's some you came into my life. Yeah. And if you need a stand, <laughs> <laughs> I'll come into your life. Is there a, or so, adorable culture to you. So we've already gone through an hour, believe it or not. I know mm -hmm. it goes that fast. Yeah, it's a time warp, my friend. Oh, is so it? is there anything else you would like to say or for people to know about you? Uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's good because you kind of pull you through. You pull me through yeah, and pull yeah. people through it. Yeah. No, that's, and, I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. It's me having a fun time listening to you. Jeff Bercy, interesting guy. Is there a part two? <laughs> we do a part two. Undoubtedly, there will be a part two. <laughs> awesome. Because part one isn't enough to really capture what all Jeff has to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, the part two may not be on uh, our dealer diaries. Maybe it's just you and I sitting around and that's with a awesome. coffee. Yeah, and talking about the next cool thing that's coming up. Just I think you know, like look at what people are doing around you, and uh, and and get into it, and go do it, get out. And I know it's hard. It's, uh, I think it's super important. And that's one of the things like I was talking about your son. I like look at how hard it must be for a young person to find themselves. Everybody's got a tattoo. It's easy to do. Yeah. Everybody's got a piercing. Everybody's yeah. got a super cool vintage hat. Yeah. Um, so imagine trying to define yourself as a young person now. You're like, yeah. yeah. Wow, no, it's, it's got to be. Yeah. Gotta there's be a lot tough. of pressure. Yeah. No, there's a lot of pressure. But I think you do that in circles of people that 
influence each other, and that's like yeah, and that's super through, awesome. Well, a lot of that th- for them is through social media. You yeah. know, that's how they envision themselves. So yeah. maybe we gotta just talk to people, actually talk, verbally talk instead of text, and you know, they'll get there. I think this generation will ultimately kind of flip back and go enough technology, enough this, yeah. you know. Also, let me go. Yeah. yeah, I think they will. Yeah. Yeah, no, then they'll go, we need to go to the lightning fields. At some point in time, they're going to realize, I think, that you can we'll make their own lightning fields. Or make their own lightning fields. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. That's one of the things that I'm constantly, um, you know, you scour YouTube because you know what people are doing around you. And you think, what is that person, what is that woman in the basement in Brazil coming up with? Yeah. What's she making? What is that person in Zimbabwe or, you know, yeah. wherever, like... Break of that thing I've never seen. I think yeah. it's like whoa. It's you'll still, ready to, but you'll still see that creative thread running through. You know, oh, yeah. Every time because mm-hmm. it stimulates you. Go, oh, oh, yeah. It's there. It's there. There. It's still there. And that's what's cool about I think being alive. You know, yeah. not checking out. Yeah. Um, All so right. So I expect my Japanese uh, haikus. Yeah, I want to see that. I do. I actually want to read that. Actually, I want. It's see. amazing. Yeah. No, I want to see the clarity. Yep. So. So I can get prepared. Awesome. <laughs> Jeff Bercy, thank you. <laughs> thank you again. Yeah, thank you very now, much, man. I told you this would be fun. It's cool. And then you just, you know, we used your real name, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> they won't be able to track you down. <laughs> no. No addresses given? No addresses. It's like cool. my brother. Yeah. Can't find him. Got an Adobe Fortress. Yeah, exactly. Jeff Bercy, Art Dealer Diaries. Thank another. you, Mark. Yeah.